My pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Our speaker for today is Molly Babel. Uh, she's going to talk about speech perception and production. I have a brief little comment here, not too brief. Let me read it. Molly Babel is the director of UBC's Speech in Context Lab. Broadly, she is interested in speech perception and production, and there is a strong theme of cross-linguistic and cross-dialectical inquiry in her work. More specifically, her research program focuses on the role of experience and exposure to phonetic and phonological knowledge. I have no idea what these are. How social knowledge may be manifested phonetically and the mental representation of phonetic and phonological knowledge. A significant portion of her work explores how interacting language systems influence one another on a phonetic level. She has investigated this within bilingual speakers, uh, English and Northern Paiute, across dialects, across dialects, Australian and New, Ze New Zealand Englishes, and within dialect, uh, dialectics, <laughs> American English. She also has a strong interest in language documentation and description. With colleagues at University of California, Berkeley, she conducted field work on Northern Paiute, the Nunek and Utu as of can. Forgive the pronunciation. <laughs> So please welcome Molly to our uh, meeting today. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Is the mic okay? All right. Great. So uh, we'll try to have everyone kind of understand a little bit about what I think about and what I do. And uh, kind of, yeah. Should I turn this down a little bit? There you go. Is that still okay volume-wise? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to that front. Okay. Um, all right. So what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about uh, spoken language and uh, how understanding spoken language is really this fun puzzle because it involves understanding the human sensory system, it involves understanding the human cognitive system, and it involves understanding kind of the, the social judgments and evaluations and behaviors that we engage in on a, a daily basis. So kind of in a nutshell, one of the, the things to keep in mind about uh, spoken human language is that it's really a really robust and multi-dimensional kind of system. And what I mean when I say that it's a robust and multi-dimensional human system is that uh, as I'm talking to you, I'm not just doing things with my kind of vocal organs that you can't see, but you're seeing me make movements with my face, with my mouth. As I get higher in terms of my pitch, my eyebrows are going to raise. And this isn't just a quirk about the way I talk. This is some. This is this is the way that we kind of engage our whole system in terms of spoken language. And so you can get a lot out of that visual information. You can get a lot of information out of that uh, acoustic auditory information. Uh, and if you uh, were vision impaired and you were feeling my face as I was talking, you'd also get information uh, about the kind of movements that I was making with my mouth. That would all help you recover what it is that I was uh, going to say. Um, as a medium, spoken language uh, conveys our thoughts and ideas and concepts. And at the same time, it also, through that same channel, provides a lot of social information. So if uh, you weren't seeing me speak to you, you'd be able to make certain social assumptions about who I am. Um, odds are that most of you, upon just hearing my voice, would assume that I'm female, would assume that I'm uh, from North America, and if you listen carefully, you might notice that I'm not from the West Coast, based on how I pronounce uh, some of my vowel sounds in particular. Um, but then there are other social dimensions that don't really get transmitted through uh, very well. If uh, I were just speaking to you, you might have some idea of how tall I am, but your guess of that might not be that accurate. You might have some idea how, how old I am, but your guess of that wouldn't be that accurate. So you want to think about kind of the, the social things that are transmitted through the speech signal as being some that you would put a lot of money on if you were making a bet, and some where you'd be like, I have a guess but I'm maybe not that confident uh, in that guess. So um, I'm lucky to work in an area, uh, and I guess I chose this area to work in because I do think that it's endlessly fascinating. In order to really understand spoken language, we need to think about our anatomical structures. We need to be thinking about the, the size and the mass of our uh, vocal organs that we have uh, in our mouths. Um, we have to be thinking about this all the way down to the level of breath control uh, in our lungs. 
Um, we need to think about our sensory system. So how does the human auditory system work? How does it receive that acoustic information that's traveling as pressure fluctuations through the air? We need to be thinking about how the visual system picks up on these uh, visual movements that it sees in my mouth. And given that our auditory and visual systems work in kind of different time domains, we have to think about how those two things get resolved cognitively uh, in the end. We need to have some kind of understanding about how neurologically our brain is actually processing this information. And we need to think about how our mind on a more philosophical level is organizing and thinking uh, about these things. Um, and crucially, we need to have an understanding of our social experiences and our kind of social imaginations of things that we think we've experienced that we may not have actually experienced and how that all plays a role in shaping how we interact with each other in terms of spoken language. So the basic steps of speech perception and production are outlined here in uh, kind of this old uh, image called the, the speech chain. And what this does is kind of walk through from the speaker over to the listener and all the different kinds of signals and transformations that we uh, need to go through. So if we start on the side of the speaker and what we need to first start with is there's got to be something that you want to say. That concept needs to be translated into kind of some linguistic code that you're going to be able to transmit. Uh, and you're going to be going from kind of using your brain to come up with that linguistic code and implementing it in terms of your motor system so that you can get it out of your mouth, so that you can move your tongue, your lips, your vocal cords in such a way that physiologically you're producing this signal that you intended to produce. That signal is going to kind of come out into the world uh, in an acoustic form. So we're talking about sound waves, particle pressure fluctuations that are just moving through the air, propagating uh, throughout the, this room right now with, with my voice. And that acoustic signal is going to be going on into the ear of whoever it is is in your surroundings. At the same time, that feedback, that signal is also getting fed into your own ear, right? So you're able to monitor what it is you're saying, how you're saying it, sometimes catching mistakes that you make or um, I often produce things and I'm like, wow, I can't believe I just pronounced the word that way. That's a change from my, my normal pronunciation. But kind of the really important part on this end here is as we go from the acoustic signal and into the ear uh, of a listener, those pressure fluctuations go through this really amazing transformation going into your uh, auditory system as a, a physical pressure fluctuation signal. They get banged out by uh, some little bones that are in your ear that keep them as kind of this uh, physical mechanical signal. And then they get turned into an electrical signal that your brain can uh, understand. So the, the human ear, we could talk for hours about the uh, kind of amazing implementation of catching all of this information that the human ear uh, does. But what comes next is those electrical kind of sensory nerves going to the brain, and then we need to decode those pressure fluctuations that we received on our eardrum into a meaningful linguistic message. So whenever I think about kind of the, the speech chain and this process that we go through, whenever we want to say anything, I think we should all pat ourselves on the back for being able to do this so efficiently in uh, a day-to-day -day, uh, kind of behavior. Now, uh, kind of getting into these steps, some of these steps in uh, a little more detail, I want to talk about accents at first as kind of an easy, a conceptually easy entry point into uh, specifically kind of where we're thinking about where accents are manifested. So we have knowledge within our brains of the way that we usually produce things. We have specific uh, motor nerves and a kind of articulatory gymnastics that we do with our mouths in order to achieve whatever accent it is that we, that we produce. Those modifications that we make in our mouths are what are going to be specifically translated into this acoustic signal in, to give us the specific accents that we, that we all produce. And then the listener is able to hear these differences and say, well, that's a little different from how I would produce it in terms of kind of identifying uh, different accents. So when we think about accents, the number one thing to always keep in mind is that we all have accents. An accent is just a manner of speaking that reflects your identity and where you are in terms of time and space. 
Um, an important thing to, to keep in mind, and I'll give you a little example of this uh, from, uh, from Queen Elizabeth II, actually, that um, while our accents change less as we age, they still do change. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind about kind of the dynamic nature of spoken language, okay? And the kind of an important point here, even if you think you speak kind of standard English or international English, whatever that might mean to you, that's still gonna be an accent. It's just an accent that's less associated with a particular geographical region or a particular social group. Um, kind of keeping this in a kind of step by step going into kind of a, a little bit more complexity here. One of the easiest ways to think about accents is in terms of word differences. So do you use the word pop or soda to describe a sweet and carbonated beverage? Uh, the uh, kind of faucet that you go up to to put your mouth over to drink out of, what do you call that? Do you call it a water fountain, a drinking fountain, uh, a bubbler? Uh, here I have an example from uh, a, an internet survey that was done that looked at uh, lexical differences, word differences in uh, Canadian English where we're looking at who says toque, who says hat, and who says stocking cap. Yeah? Sir, to interrupt. Uh, just a reminder, we're going to save all our questions and comments until after the presentation. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, I, mean, I don't mind being you can interrupted. Ask me if you like. Yeah, yeah. So, are you talking about a pronunciation difference or a spelling difference? Well, I both because when people see either O-R-U is the I think it was limited to the just spelled like this, but I do love your description of using your software to interpret this. That's the perfect way to think about the, these kind of cognitive activities that we do here. Um, in th these kinds of surveys, usually what it would be is there'd be an image of this object you're supposed to identify, and then uh, given that it was administered online, I'm sure it was just kind of click which word you would use for that. Yeah. But, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But so I think these kinds of word differences uh, are kind of an accent difference we can all really easily wrap our heads around and talk about um, in, in the world. Okay. Um, we can also talk about accents as pronunciation differences. And we can talk about these pronunciation differences on a couple different levels. Uh, but first, let's kind of try to talk about this in terms of kind of a categorical, do you say it this way or this way? And what I want you to all think about is uh, how you produce the name of the city that we're living in right now. Do you say Vancouver or do you say Vancouver? <laughs> I'm seeing the, the Vang the Vang pronunciation got some funny looks from from some of you. So this is uh, this this is a pronunciation variant that you uh, hear. So whether people say Van or Vang as the 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 way that this is pronounced. And one thing to think about uh, with this is that sometimes. These differences are hard to intuit. It's hard to, to naturally say to yourself, well, how do I say this word? Which pronunciation variant am I doing? Uh, but luckily, we can make acoustic measurements of these. And I'll walk through uh, a bit about speech acoustics here. Um, but this visualization that I'm showing you here, these lines represent uh, the uh, parts of the speech signal that have maximum energy levels. Uh, in the vowel in that first syllable of Vancouver. And what these, uh, these trajectories tell us is when we have this kind of pinch at the end of these, we know from what we know about the relationship between speech acoustics and speech articulation that that means that the speaker was going into a production that was ng kind of sounding. So ng versus n. Can everyone hear that difference? Nasals, nasals are hard sounds uh, acoustically, and so I wouldn't be surprised if we had a little bit of an issue kind of transmitting that. But what we see from this is that we have, so this speaker here is clearly engaging in a Vancouver pronunciation. This speaker is clearly engaging in a Vancouver. But this speaker here is kind of slowly going in that direction, but we might not categorically want to say that it's to the same degree as these two speakers. 
And this speaker also is very different from these three speakers who have these relatively straight trajectories, which tell us that the speaker is going into a production where they're making that nasal sound by putting their tongue towards the back of their teeth, as opposed to making it that, that tightness in your mouth and the back of your mouth. So we can make measurements uh, about the way that people produce these things in order to get a better understanding of the kinds of accent differences that may or may not exist. Okay, um, another example related to accents here. So this is uh, accents as uh, shifts over time. Uh, in honor of the royal wedding, I thought I would put in some uh, Queen Elizabeth II uh, data here. And this was a really influential study that uh, came out uh, several years ago now. Uh, but this is a really uh, from a really amazing data set. So Queen Elizabeth II has been giving Christmas Day broadcasts for decades and decades. And what these researchers did is that they uh, took measurements about how she produced her vowels from the Christmas messages from the 1950s through the 1980s and compared her pronunciations of vowels to uh, the variety of English that's called Southern Standard British English, which is the kind of standard variety that's spoken in, uh, in uh, Southern England kind of generally. And uh, what's important here is that we, uh, we um, how many of you have heard the expression the Queen's English? Right? So this is the idea that the queen, the royal family, that they speak a particularly uh, unique, a socially prestigious variety of uh, British English. But what these data actually show, so this is uh, hard to see here. So each of these panels is showing us the pronunciation uh, based on acoustic measurements of different vowels. And within each of these panels, uh, and this part is what's gonna be really hard to see, is there is a five indicating data that were from the broadcast in the 1950s. There's uh, an eight indicating the data from the Christmas broadcast from the 1980s. And then the S represents the, the average value of the, the local population of the, the common people. And within each of these vowels, you can see that as the queen uh, aged, she started to talk more and more like not the Queen's English, but like Southern Standard British English. So over time, and the authors interpret this as kind of a, a change in social norms of the royal family needing to reach out and interact in a more natural way uh, with, with the people, um, she started to change her pronunciations uh, of, of her vowels. Okay. Okay, so uh, just kind of a, a little a reminder here kind of about kind of how do these accent things uh, kind of change? Why do they change? How do they change? All of the way, uh, all of these measurements, the way that we talk, they're all based on our physiology and anatomy that, that we have. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about this concept of source filter theory. Um, we are shaping how we produce spoken language uh, based on those around us. So we're using auditory models that we get from the people that we interact with to shape how we speak. And this all together means that our accents are gonna be a function of how we shape our speech organs in order to kind of match the models of uh, those around us in ways that are limited by our own physiology uh, that we have. Okay. So in terms of how we make our measurements when we're talking uh, about speech, um, I'm first gonna describe to you kind of the categorical system that we can use to describe differences in speech. And then I'm gonna to introduce to you uh, some, a bit about speech acoustics. Um, so we can describe and quantify kind of categorical pronunciation differences using what's called the International Phonetic Alphabet. Um, and this is just a, a, a categorical system of letters uh, of which we have 170, or excuse me, 107 unique letters and we have 52 different diacritics that we can add to those letters to get at uh, particular uh, speech patterns. And all of these characters are meant to represent all of the sounds that are used in the world's languages, okay? Um, and to give you an idea of what this looks like, these are the vowels that we have within the IPA. Um, so each one of these symbols represents uh, a particular kind of sound, an idealized sound, uh, a group of sounds. Some of them are letters that are familiar to you in terms of kind of this, uh, in terms of the IPA is always pronounced as E, 
Uh, other symbols aren't going to be very uh, familiar to you. So this symbol that we have here is uh, what we would call a high back vowel like oo, but it's unrounded, so the lips are spread. So uh. When you, when you make vowel sounds, when you make any sound that isn't part of your own native language, it feels a little bit funny when you, when you produce them. But this is a vowel uh, that's in Japanese, if anyone in the room speaks uh, Japanese. But so we have these organized in a particular way that reflects uh, kind of where we typically produce these sounds in our mouths. So this is a, a mid-sagittal uh, head and this is kind of a, an example of what we look at a lot and think about a lot when we're thinking about speech patterns, where here you have your tongue, here are the, the teeth and your lips. Uh, this little bit here is called your epiglottis. This is a very non-realistic looking uh, vo your vocal fold right here. And so what you want to think about is uh, you're kind of going to be making movements with your vocal folds and then air pressure fluctuations are going to be kind of traveling through your mouth here. This little bit here is what you open and close in order to make a nasalized sound. And we'll talk a little bit more about kind of what you're doing with your mouth here. But what you want to be thinking about is how then this vowel space fits into the mouth. So with an oo-like sound, what I called a high back vowel, this is a vowel that's produced high in your mouth and as far back as you can go. An E vowel is produced high in your mouth and as far front as you can go. And then we have these ranges in between, so we can talk about low vowels that are made with a low jaw, a low tongue position, compared to these high vowels, and vowels that are front and vowels that are back. Okay? All right. Now, when we describe vowels in this way, we're talking about them in terms of uh, their articulatory landmarks, approximately what you're doing uh, with your tongue. But a really important caveat to say with this is, this is not the best way to describe vowels. Uh, we'll get to the better way uh, in a second. But still, this is a really easy, straightforward categorical system that we can use, and we can use it to compare different dialects. So for example, kind of uh, sticking with our example of the uh, high back vowel, oo, we think of this as being a, a high back vowel that exists in this high back part of the vowel space. But in terms of these kinds of comparisons, we can see that, well, actually, the oo in Australian English is produced much more forward in the mouth. And so we can, we can make uh, these kinds of comparisons and descriptions using this kind of symbolic system like this. Now, the better way to describe vowels is through their acoustic properties. And when we talk about speech acoustics, we also want to have an understanding that, well, the even better way to understand speech patterns is in terms of their auditory properties. So we have a pretty solid understanding of how the auditory system distorts incoming information based on its physiological structure. Um, kind of <laughs> these are both kind of parentheticals because they're they're important little notes here, but uh, they're they're not they're not so crucial. We can just take speech acoustics and pretend uh, that they're that they're doing a decent job. But what's uh, interesting here is we have a pretty good understanding of what the auditory system does in terms of modifying acoustic patterns. Uh, the auditory information that gets fed to our minds, we have a less solid understanding of the kind of reorganization of what's similar and what's different uh, that happens uh, on that end compared to the auditory transformation. Okay, so now we get to get into some basic physics. And for me, this is one of the things that makes spoken language so fun, is that we can talk about kind of, oh, I hear this difference, I hear that difference, but we can also talk about needing to go in and concretely measure using Fourier transforms sound waves and their properties. So we get to do some kind of more feely science and we get to do some more hard science in the context of this. So the core theory in speech acoustics is something that's called source filter theory. And uh, with this, we need to have an understanding of what's a source and what's a filter. Um, for the purposes of talking uh, about uh, the source, we can kind of break it down into two really basic kinds of sounds. So for sounds that are like vowels, and we call these voice sounds, the noise source is your vibrating vocal folds. So what I want you all to do is put your hands on your neck <laughs> and uh, just make a sound like ah. Uh, and can you feel a little bit of a vibration that's going on there? Okay, so that is where the noise is coming from when you're saying ah. Uh. 
okay? That's all. Now, when you uh, say a sound like you can put your hand on your throat and you're not gonna feel anything. So it's gonna be open there. What you're doing there is you're spreading your vocal folds and you're allowing air to pass through and you're generating the noise by the fact that you've made a tight constriction, tight but not fully closed constriction in your mouth that's gener generating turbulent airflow. And that's what that noise is there, okay? So, uh, those are kind of the two basic kinds of noise sources that we have, kind of turbulent airflow uh, and uh, the, the, the kind of noise that we generate at uh, our vocal folds. And then we want to be thinking about, well, what's the filter part of this? And the filter is anything that's upstream from your noise source. So when I say upstream, what I mean is so when you're vibrating your vocal folds for a vowel-like sound, the filter that's shaping that is everything that's on top of it. So your neck and up through your oral cavity. When you make a s-like sound and you're making that constriction, um, depending on how you make it, right behind your teeth, on your teeth, your filter is just anything that's in front of that, right? So then you're dealing with a really small kind of filter configuration. Okay. Now a bit more detail here. This is, uh, these are images of your vocal fold source. So if we were able to stick a camera down all of your throats while you were making speech sounds, we'd be able to capture the patterns uh, of, your, of your vocal folds um, and the different ways in which they can vibrate. So when you're, when you're, doing, uh, when you're making an ah-like uh sound, your vocal folds are clapping in, in a pattern like this but the exact way in which they clap together gives you your particular voice quality um, that's kind of a signature of what you sound like. Um, the rate at which your vocal folds engage in that vibratory activity is what the pitch of your voice is. And given that this is this complex uh, vibratory mechanism, we don't only get this pitch from your vocal folds, but what we get are a complex series of harmonics or overtones, you can think about it that way, uh, that infinitely go up in frequency, okay? And this is all what's generated by your vocal folds doing their fun little clapping motion. All right, and then, so we have our, our source spectrum. So uh, this, these kinds of images, oh, I should have walked you through that uh, image a little bit more. This image that we have here is called a power spectrum. Um, and it's uh, the same kind of measurement uh, that you make if you're measuring earthquakes, if you're measuring uh, volcanoes. It's a Fourier transformation. It's just of this, we're dealing with speech, okay? Um, and we're looking at frequency, so going up in frequency, and then we're looking at amplitude, the, the energy that is within that signal. And this is what your source spectrum would look like if we were only dealing, if we temporarily removed your head and we're only looking uh, at your source. But you, of course, have your heads on top of your source. And so we have the source that's being generated uh, at, your, at your glottis, at your, your vocal folds down here. And then that noise is traveling through your vocal tract. And you put your vocal tract into particular shapes to make particular sounds. And that shaping then provides increased energy to some frequency components and not others, okay? And so in order to get different vowels, you just put your mouth in a different shape and that's going to enhance the energy in some parts of the frequency spectrum, and it's going to uh, decrease the energy in other parts of the spectrum, okay? So in order to make different vowel sounds, what you're doing is you're just modifying the energy that was provided by your, your source here. I realize that speech acoustics are, are not intuitive and it's a lot of uh, different information. Um, I wanted to uh, show you this video here, but it's, uh, I didn't get connected to, I forgot to get connected to the, the internet. Um, but what we have here is a, a video of uh, someone in a, an MRI uh, speaking and singing. Um, and looking at that uh, is a good opportunity to think about all the ways in which you're modifying your filter, your vocal tract as you're speaking. Um, but so 
I thought ahead that if the video didn't work, uh, a useful sentence to say uh, is, who hired this editor? So if you say that to yourself, who hired this editor? You can feel that your mouth is going into a bunch of different shapes, and especially with a word like editor, your tongue is do doing this da da da. And you want to be kind of marveling at the uh, gymnastics that your mouth is doing as you're uh, producing uh, these kinds of sounds. Now, my own uh, professional interests lie on kind of this half of the speech chain. So thinking about speech acoustics, uh, thinking about the auditory system, thinking about how we map all of that to uh, meaning. And the reason why I find that end of the speech chain more appealing is that there's, uh, we don't have direct access to each other's mouths. So what we need to do is decode these messages from the acoustic signal that uh, we receive. And the acoustic signal can be really ambiguous for uh, a number of reasons. And that creates nice puzzles uh, for investigation. So uh, luckily, in the news this week, there was this Yanny Laurel video that kind of nicely illustrates, uh, illustrates uh, the, the kinds of ambiguities that we, that we see. So how many of you listened to the Yanny versus Laurel uh, video this week? So a few of you. We can, we'll do a little bit uh, of these here. So what I think is, at first, linguistically interesting about this is that we want to be thinking about so the word Laurel and then this non-word Yanny. And as you produce them, they feel very different in your mouths. So how can they be uh, confusable? Um, here is, this is the, uh, of, uh, a spectrogram of the, uh, the ambiguous token that was floating around uh, online. When we're looking at a spectrogram, we're looking at time on the uh, horizontal axis. We're looking at frequency, so uh, where the energy is on the vertical axis. And the darkness within this spectrogram is showing us which energies are enhanced based on the shape that a speaker's mouth is in. So I'll play this sound for you, uh, and we'll take a survey as to whether people hear Yanni or Laurel. Laurel. How many hear Yanni? How many hear Laurel? Yeah, all right. So this is perfect, perfect divide, right? This is people, reasonable people, have very different uh, interpretations of what they're hearing here. Now, how can these words be confusable, even though they feel so different uh, in your mouth? So here I have uh, spectrograms and recordings of someone actually saying Yanny and someone actually saying Laurel. And I'll play these for you, and we'll see if there's any ambiguity uh, about that. Yanny. Does that sound like, how many of you think that sounds like Yanny? Does anyone think that one sounds like Laurel? Uh, uh, both, yeah, yeah, okay. And then uh, here's a recording of Laurel. Laurel. The recording quality of these is not so hot. And I actually intentionally made them, uh, these recordings, not so great because the internet video version is also not the, the best recording. But do most of you hear Laurel from this one? Yeah. Cool. So looking at Yanni and Laurel, even though they feel very different in your mouth, you can see that if you look at their spectrograms, they look somewhat similar. So we have right below this 2000, uh, 2800 hertz mark here, we have this dropping in terms of where we get most of the energy that goes down and then goes back up. We see the exact same pattern here in the, the Laurel token. So even though, I'm gonna put these up next to the one, which is, this is the, the internet token itself, and then this is a real production of Yanni and a real production of Laurel, you can see by just looking at these images that they share a lot of acoustic similarities, right? So even though they're made very differently in your mouth, acoustically, they're potentially ambiguous based on the frequencies that are amplified in those configurations. Now, let's see. I was gonna also walk you through some uh, ambiguity that we see in the context of uh, sounds like s and sh. So this symbol that we have uh, here 
is the international phonetic alphabet symbol for uh, a the sound in a word like ship or shop um, compared to the, the S that we use for the sounds like sip and sop. Um, and what we can see here is are some sagittal heads showing where the S sound is made compared to where the S sound is made, so further back. Um, and this arrow here indicating what's called a sublingual cavity, which all contributes to S having a larger filter in front of it. Larger things are going to uh, amplify the energy of lower frequencies. And so in terms of the uh, spectral energy that we see in these spectrograms here, you can see that there's a, a nice mess of information here in the lower frequencies for ESH, um, and the higher frequencies are more amplified uh, for S. Now, S and ESH end up being these really interesting sounds to consider in terms of their ambiguity, because how they differ uh, across different speakers. So I'm gonna jump to this image here, where we're looking at kind of a measurement of where is most of that acoustic energy in S and ESH. So here's our distribution that we have for 20 speakers for ESH. Here's the distribution for S. And you can see that we have a region here that overlaps considerably, right? So what you wanna be thinking about is as a listener, if you get uh, someone producing one of these sounds that falls into this acoustic region here, how are you going to decide whether they said a s sound or a sh sound? Okay, and this is these kinds of issues are one of the big puzzles in speech perception. How do we resolve these kinds of ambiguities? What kind of information do we resort to uh, in order to help us teeter on one side uh, than another? Um, so these are just some more uh, examples of kind of ambiguity that we might face. So for example, if we look at the data from this particular speaker here, you can see that this speaker doesn't overlap in their productions, but this speaker's S completely overlaps with this speaker's sh sound, right? So this creates a kind of perceptual puzzle of uh, things that are physically identical acoustically, you need to interpret them in one way or another in order to effectively communicate with these people in the world. And these aren't extreme examples by any means, right? This is kind of a day-to-day -day puzzle that you encounter as a, a speaker and listener uh, of a language. So how do we resolve uh, these ambiguities? A lot of our ambiguities are, are resolved based on our experiences that we have in the world. So things like men typically are larger than females. That means that they're gonna have lower frequencies that are amplified uh, compared to females. And we just anticipate that when we interact with people in the world. But what's extremely important uh, in terms of our understanding of this is that these are expectations and generalizations that we make that often fall into the realm of being stereotypes, which can be wrong and lead us down uh, an incorrect path. So what I want us to think about in kind of the, the next uh, 10 minutes or so here is how our social biases shape what we expect we're gonna hear from particular speakers, because this is something that listeners seem to rely on in order to resolve the ambiguities that we uh, find in day-to-day -day, uh, interaction. So most of this research, uh, ultimately, ultimately I'll tell you about a project we did here in Vancouver, but note that most of this work is in the context of, uh, done in con the context of the United States. Um, so for example, things like people from the Northern US have negative stereotypes about Southern varieties of US English. Uh, and these, uh, these stereotypes lead to really overt accent discrimination uh, in housing. And uh, children have already developed these kinds of stereotypes themselves by the time they're nine to 10 years old, presumably based on information uh, in the media. Um, and what I want us to be thinking about in the context of what we're gonna build to here are the kinds of ethnicity accent associations we make in our day-to-day -day, uh, interactions. So uh, these are, uh, this is an image uh, from a study that was done by uh, Yi and colleagues uh, in Austin, Texas uh, in uh, 2013. Um, and I want you to think first, so looking at these two speakers, they're both producing uh, a sentence here, the girl loved the sweet coffee. When you look at these images, what accents do you expect these individuals uh, to have? 
So in the context of this particular experiment, uh, these speakers were uh, either speakers of the local variety of English or someone who was a native speaker of Korean and spoke Korean accented English. Okay? So thinking about in the context of uh, the study in Texas of kind of the uh, associations between who's going to have a local accent and who's not going to have a local accent uh, in this experiment. Now what the researchers did in this study is they had trials where the speakers, uh, you could see a video of the speaker as they were producing the sentence, and some trials where you couldn't see who the speaker was and you just had an audio only trial. In these kinds of experiments, uh, the sentences are embedded in a little bit of noise to make the task uh, more challenging. Now, one thing that we always expect is that when you can see a video of a speaker, you're going to have an easier time understanding them than when you can't see that video, right? So this kind of audio-visual enhancement is kind of a standard finding that you would always expect to find. Um, and what uh, Yi et al. found is that, yeah, so what we're comparing here are the number of words that listeners were able to get out of the sentences for the native English speaker and the Korean accented speaker in the audio only condition compared to the audio visual condition. So what we can see is if we first compare these two bars in the audio only conditions, the native speakers are more intelligible, listeners could get more of the words out uh, of the noise than when they were listening to the Korean accented speaker. And that result itself shouldn't be surprising, nor should it be alarming. We're going to be better at understanding accents we have more experience with. Okay? But what is surprising is that the amount of benefit of getting the visual signal uh, was less for the Korean accented speaker. So having the Korean accented speaker's face along with the video didn't give as much of a benefit as it did for the locally accented uh, white speaker. And even more alarming is that this effect was larger for uh, participants in the study who had the stronger Caucasian equals American, Asian equals foreign kind of bias. So if listeners went into this study with a bias, they were less able to get information uh, out of the signal. And what Yi and I'll talk about in the context of this paper is this uh, question of kind of who do listeners see as uh, American? Um, and I think these results are really depressing in the multicultural societies that we live in. They're, they're depressing, but they're not really that surprising given the literature uh, that we know about implicit bias. So Asian Americans in the context of uh, the US are explicitly viewed as equally American as white Americans, but implicit attitudes cons in studies consistently show that there's this bias that white equals American, Asian equals foreign. Okay? And we want to be thinking about these implicit associations as things that we learn from our uh, cultural environment and context um, in ways that are kind of delivered to us through the media, through the people that we uh, interact with. Now, um, my uh, former student Jamie Russell and I were interested in whether these kinds of findings are specific to uh, the US and specifically parts of the US that have particular demographic uh, populations. So we wanted to look at uh, a similar kind of study in a Canadian context, right? And I think you all have a, an understanding of why Vancouver is a really interesting place to do this kind of work. Uh, about 40% of uh, Metro Vancouverites uh, are, are immigrants, uh, myself included. Uh, the majority of immigrants in Metro Vancouver uh, are from China, and Chinese languages, so thinking specifically about Cantonese and Mandarin here, are uh, the second most widely spoken languages outside of English in the, the Lower Mainland. And thinking specifically about our subject population uh, at UBC, 39% of all students at UBC uh, identify uh, as, uh, uh, as Chinese, and 35% of students at UBC identify as white. So what we have then in Vancouver and at UBC is a much more balanced demographic group than what we'd expect uh, in, uh, in Austin, Texas, where the Yi et al. study was from. Okay. So uh, our speaker sample that we uh, used here, we had uh, six individuals, college students who identified as Chinese Canadian, six who identified as uh, white Canadian. All of them grew up in Richmond and were native speakers. 
of the local variety of English. In a separate experiment that we did with these voices, we had listeners listen to the voices and try to categorize the ethnic identity of these individuals, and listeners couldn't do it at all. So we're confident going into this that these 12 voices were all kind of just normal local speakers of Canadian English. What we did in uh, our experiment was we presented trials either that had the face of the speaker presented along with it, or uh, a screen like this that didn't have the face, so it was audio only. And we gave listeners two different kinds of speech tasks. So one, they listened to these the sentences in a little bit of noise, and I'll show you what that sounds like uh, in a second. And their task was just to type out what the sentences were to the best of their uh, ability. Um, and then we also had listeners do an accentedness rating task where they rated each speaker uh, in terms of a foreign accent, no foreign accent to a very strong foreign accent. Okay, to give you an idea of what these kinds of experiments are like, they're, they're pretty challenging and you need to make them challenging, otherwise you don't find uh, uh, interesting results if everyone can understand everything. So first I'm gonna play you uh, the sentence in noise. And we'll see, um, with this kind of uh, setup, uh, it's even more challenging than it is in lab conditions. But here's the sentence in noise. Did, did anyone get anything out of that? You, you could maybe hear that there was some mumbling going on underneath the noise, but nothing else. Yeah. So here's the sentence, the top one in, in, the, in the clear here. The table has three legs. So the sentence is, the table has three legs. Um, now we'll play the one in noise again to see if you can get a little bit more out of it. Maybe a little bit more there. Okay, so what did we find uh, in this study? So uh, unfortunately, uh, we essentially replicated uh, some of the heart of what was found in the Yi et al. study. So uh, what we're looking at here is in the audio only conditions, listeners' ability to do, uh, to get the words out of the noise for the, the Chinese Canadian speakers and the white Canadian speakers. And uh, this difference isn't statistically significant, so they're uh, equivalent there. But what we see here is this fall for the Chinese Canadian speakers um, when listeners know they're listening to a Chinese Canadian. So uh, our students at UBC were equally good at doing this task with the white Canadian voices in audio only or when they knew they were listening to a white speaker but they struggled only when they knew that they were listening to a Chinese Canadian. And in terms of the perceived accent, we kind of have a, a, a different uh, spin on these here, where in the case of perceived accentedness, there's kind of this, uh, this benefit to being a white Canadian speaker, where once listeners know that they're listening to a white Canadian, suddenly that voice sounds less accented. So we see the same, uh, approximately the same rating for the, the Chinese Canadian voices for accent in this, but we see uh, this uh, less accent when you know you're listening to a white speaker. So these results aren't warm, fuzzy results uh, at all, but we need to try to have an understanding of uh, why we are seeing these kinds of effects, even in a place that's really multicultural uh, like uh, Vancouver. So what we think is happening uh, with these data is that listeners are wrongly assuming that Chinese Canadians don't speak with a local accent. So there's, a, there's a, an assumption by our participants that if you're not white, you're not a native speaker uh, of English. And so we can think about this in terms of kind of the, the predictions that we make, uh, because we know we do make predictions about what someone's going to sound like based on what they look like that in the context of seeing a white Canadian face, you have these expectations about what they're gonna sound like, and what you actually hear from them is a pretty good match to that expectation. But in the context of listeners thinking that they're gonna hear a Chinese Canadian speaker, they're making the wrong predictions about that signal. They're expecting a non-native accent, but when they get a native accent, and then there's this mismatch, that's where we get a loss of intelligibility. So, it seems like we have a case here where listeners are creating these wrong generalizations, these wrong expectations about a speech community, and that's interfering with their ability to understand what they're saying. Okay, so uh, kind of wrapping up here, right? 
this kind of assumption that if you are not white, you're a non-native speaker of English, is going to be the wrong assumption to make for many, many speakers uh, in Vancouver. Um, and interacting in the world with these kinds of implicit, these implicit assumptions is going to have negative repercussions for communication and for kind of social justice generally. And then this is, this is my last slide, and then we can uh, have some conversations about this. Um, what I want you to take away and remember from this talk are kind of the, the following basic concepts, kind of any, any, any set of these. That kind of the, the process of producing, perceiving, uh, producing, perceiving, and processing spoken language is, involves a really complex set of events, right? We're going from the mind of a speaker into the mind of a listener. There's a ton of ambiguity in spoken language that listeners use their expectations and experience with the world to resolve. Um, but these expectations are sometimes really wrong, okay? Uh, and that contributes to communication breakdowns. Uh, and ultimately what this means is that listeners play an active role in speech communication and we have agency as listeners to kind of improve our ability to uh, understand a, a diverse range of speakers. So thanks for listening and I'll end with my acknowledgments here.